Hello, studio. Hello, Don. Hello, Hello everybody watching this online. This is going to be fun. We're going to talk about the cartel and about your background and uh, about the drug war in, in great detail. Uh, so is a full confession. Uh, I am reading the cartel presently. I have not finished it yet, uh, but I'm pretty sure that a drug lord billionaire named El Chapo has uh, because, as I understand it in the news recently, uh, he basically uh, escaped from a, a Mexican prison and is, I think, living the novel. Uh, and so I want to talk to you about what the cartel is about and uh, if, if you can predict what's going to happen next. Well, yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, the cartel is, is about the Mexican drug cartels, as you might have already worked out. And one of the major characters, uh, Don Barrera, is in this book, not his personality, but his actions and what happens are, are drawn from El Chapo. And in fact, there's a chapter rather early in the book about El Chapo's first escape. Uh, from a maximum security prison in 2001. So when I woke up Saturday morning and heard this news, I, it was crazy, you know. And uh, and, and it, it, as I understand it, a lot of a lot of the book is based off of El Chapo. I mean, it, it's not just it's not just paralleling um, this this real life character, but is in fact drawing from him. Yeah, you know, if you want to follow the Mexican situation during the years of this book, you're really talking about the Sinaloa cartel. They are the driving engine behind all of this. And that's, that's Guzman's organization. So it, it tracks him really pretty closely. And I did a book about 10 years ago called The Power of the Dog about the origins of the Mexican cartel. And uh, it's the same character. And so it's following these two guys, a DEA agent and a drug lord in their vendetta over the course of about 45 years. How, how do you get into the heads and mindsets of these characters? Because you've got, you've got different perspectives going on here. You've got uh, Keller, who's a DEA agent. I think in the, in the Power of the Dog, at one point, you've got the perspective of a 26-year-old girl from California. Am I, am I getting that correct? You, you have it so, so exactly not, correct. I, I, I've been trying to figure out how they think for a very long time myself. Yeah, uh, and right. and you've, you've managed to get into their heads and, and write them. How do, you, how do you get into the mindsets of these widely different characters? You know, it, it's, it's my job as a novelist to do that. You know, I think that novelists can do things that journalists often can't or shouldn't. And one of those things is to imagine the inner lives of characters. Uh, and to do that, you, you need to get out and talk to them. You know, you read a lot about them, you read history, you read journalism, but at the end of the day, you go to prisons, you go out on the streets, you go to Mexico, you talk to DEA people, uh, you talk to convicts, you talk to gangbangers and their families. Um, because I want the reader to see the world through those people's points of view. Well, and, and on that note of the, the gangbangers and the, the, the drug lords and that kind of thing, uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the book tremendously. Uh, however, it, it is dealing with oftentimes dark material. Uh, the, the world of drug lords and apparently narcotic trafficking, not always that light, not always that pleasant. There's a lot of evil stuff going on. How do you, how do you uh, imbibe that much... Um, heady and, and oftentimes sinister information and, and keep from getting tapped out uh, in the process? Uh, you get tapped out in the process is the honest answer to that. You know, um, I'd like to say that I didn't. You know, and, and I don't want to compare myself to people in Mexico or Mexican journalists who were there every day and living through this every day. And the book is dedicated to 132 Mexican journalists who were killed during the period covered in this book. So that's not me, I'm not that kind of hero. But yeah, I mean, on a virtual daily basis, I'd be writing about or interviewing people, families, survivors, uh, about murders and massacres. I, I spend too much time looking at atrocity videos and photographs and trying to figure out the stories behind them. Uh, you have to make a very deliberate effort uh, at the end of the day to try to leave that in your office. Uh, it's nothing I'd want to bring in to my wife or to my kid, you know, and so when your wife asks you, well, what'd you do today? You know, well, I worked on the book and, and kind of leave it at that. But I, I don't think I'm, in all candor, as resilient as I was when I wrote the first book. And this phase of the Mexican situation was so much more violent, so much more sadistic, that it was, it was kind of tough to do. The other thing that's been interesting uh, is that on this tour, I've been on tour for about a month now, not a day goes by if I'm doing a public appearance where someone doesn't come up to me uh, whose loved one was killed um, during this period and, and wants to talk about it. You know, so it's, it's been, yeah. 
Well, and, and you've been following this for a long time. You've done a lot of research uh, going back quite a few years detailing the, the drug cartel. Is there anything that has surprised you over the course of the research you've done that you hadn't anticipated about uh, narcotic trafficking, the drug war, or anything like that? Oh, sure. You know, when I, when I start, I've been writing about this now for about 15 years. I didn't realize that until maybe two or three weeks ago. Someone pointed it out to me, you know, that you've been at this since 1998, writing and researching this subject. Never wanted to. I, I started out to try to explain why a massacre that happened near our home had happened. Uh, a lot of surprises. Uh, for this era, the book, I mean, the role of women and how it's changed is, is amazing. And if there's anything that's inspiring, sort of the rose, you know, that pops out, uh, it's the role of women. Uh, I, I have no way of accounting for the kind of courage it takes, for instance, Andrew, for a 19-year-old woman in a little town uh, on the other side of the Texas border uh, who the four previous police chiefs had been murdered for being in their jobs, and she volunteers to take that job. And when I first heard that story, I thought, well, there's one of these women. There were at least eight. Uh, a woman mayor. Down, down south who uh, was attacked in, by guns four times, gunned down. The second attack killed her husband. The third attack, she was grievously wounded. She comes back out. She holds a press conference. She shows her wounds to the camera. Uh, and then she looks into the lens and says to the cartels, you won't stop me. I, I can't explain that kind of courage. Women social activists who took over towns when the governments had fled, who, who stood up for prisoners that the army had taken, who went on hunger strikes, uh, who led marches, protest marches. Uh, amazing. Uh, someone in an audience the other night used the word grace about them, and I think that that's accurate. So that was a surprising thing. The, the role of our government in the creation of the Mexican cartels back in the 80s was a surprising thing. So there, there are a lot of surprises. Uh, I imagine over the course of researching this that you, you would develop a lot of very strong opinions about the drug war one way or the other. Uh, do you have to internally check your, your, your impulse to communicate that opinion uh, to keep it from knocking out plot or anything like that? Or do they, do they weave pretty well together? What do you do? Uh, listen, at the end of the day, I'm a novelist. I write thrillers, I write what I hope are entertaining, interesting, scary, suspenseful books that take you into this world. Certainly I have political opinions, but I, I can't preach in the books. Now, I cheat sometimes. You know, I'm allowed to write dialogue, so I, I put thoughts and words into characters' voices, and there's a, there's a couple of rants in this book where people just go off about the war on drugs. But what I did do about Three weeks ago or a month ago, I think, is I, I took out a full-page ad in the Washington Post, uh, uh, an open letter to Congress um, demanding an end to the war on drugs. So rather than put that in my novels, I thought, you know, I'm just going to be out front with it. I've been researching this for 15 years. I've seen the bodies. I've talked to the prisoners. I've talked to the families. I've been to the funerals. And uh, I thought, you know what, I'm just coming out with it. I'm going to do it in Congress's hometown, and took out an ad. Well, I, I'm glad you did, and I, I wasn't sure whether it would be germane of me to enter your personal politics, but if you went ahead and put them on the Washington Post's classifieds, then I, I could probably talk to you in a little bit. Hardly a secret. So, uh, so you, you, you are not in favor of the drug war then? No, I'm very much against it. You know, um, uh, I've been close to it now for a long time. Um, and uh, it's, it's time to end it. it. We've been doing the same thing for 45 years. And things are not better, they're worse. We have the largest prison population in the history of the world. Uh, I think that the war on drugs has contributed significantly to the tensions between our police departments and our inner city communities. Uh, it's been a disaster. And drugs are more plentiful, cheaper, and more potent than they've ever been. That, to me, sounds like losing. And so uh, it's time to legalize all drugs. It's time to treat drugs as the medical issue they are, not a law enforcement issue. And God help us, not a military issue. Yeah. <laughs> I, 
I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And just to add a little bit, you're, you're in California, and we, we were talking in the green room beforehand that you, you never see anybody shooting up a Zinfandel distributor. Uh, like, weirdly enough, alcohol does not have that problem in the United States, but everything else does. Uh, I, I, think you're, I think you're dead on on that. What, are there things that you think that Americans ought to know that have not been communicated to Americans? Like, something that I, that I find very interesting about your work is that there are these horrifically brutal, violent things going on with our neighbors. And when ISIS does that, we're all aware that ISIS did it. And we're all very freaked out by that. We want to know why they're doing it. We want to know the underlying causes. This has been going on for years in Mexico, and, and we don't really pay as much attention to that. Well, we don't. Uh, when, when all the ISIS videos started to come out and the beheadings and immolations and that sort of thing, for me, it was a rerun. Uh, I've been seeing these things since 2005, since May 17th, 2005. <laughs> Uh, because the ISIS just took a, a, a page out of the cartel's playbooks. Um, since 2001, there have been something like 100,000 people killed in Mexico in drug-related violence. Now, if you do the math, there's nothing like 100,000 drug traffickers in Mexico. So most of those people are innocent people, and many of them are women and children. Uh, so the, the, the cartel started to videotape a lot of their atrocities as a way of terrorizing people, as a way of uh, propaganda, because they would usually make their victims, who are rival cartel members often on these videos, confess what they had done, uh, and as a means of recruitment, sadly, just like ISIS. Uh, but this period of the Mexican drug wars coincides almost exactly with the post-9-11 era. And so I think that our attention has been, understandably, focused on the Middle East, on Middle Eastern terrorism, on Iraq, on Afghanistan, because we had 3,000 people killed in 9-11 and because we had people over there being killed as, as well as local people. So it's, it's understandable to me that we haven't paid that much attention to the Mexican situation, even though it's next door, because there's only so much the human psyche can absorb. At the same time, uh, you know, that we point our finger at Mexican corruption, and I've done it this week, you know, with the Chapo so-called escape. Uh, I think if I were Mexican and I were looking north across the border, I would ask what kind of corruption exists in the United States, the corruption of, if you will, our collective soul that makes us the biggest drug market in the world at a rate five times our population. You're absolutely right about that, and it's it's one of those things too where they're uh, they're they're selling. I'm pretty sure we're buying. Yeah. Uh, America. We actually really like drugs in America. We really like drugs a lot, uh, which is why it's so profitable and and why they're they're going to keep doing it. Well, well, the problem is 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 this juxtaposition between our appetite for drugs and our prohibition of them. So at the same time we spend billions of dollars buying them, we spend billions of dollars trying to seize them, bust them. That's what creates the power of the cartels. Here, here's the sort of arithmetic of it. If you criminalize something, perforce, only criminals can sell it. If only criminals can sell it, there's no recourse to law. If there's no recourse to law, there's only recourse to violence. If there's only recourse to violence, the most violent will inevitably rise to the top, meet the cartels. And so it's both our appetite and our effort to prevent them. So our justice system uh, <laughs> and the cartels are, are in a symbiotic relationship. They need each other to survive. One of the few growth industries in our country right now is prison construction. And the phrase prison privatization might be the saddest phrase I've heard in America in the last half century. You know, corrections is capitalism. So to, to go back into the book, um, early on, but without revealing any of the plot, uh, Adon is, is revealed to be the, 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 the main uh, antagonist in this novel, is revealed to be a bad guy. Sure. Uh, and not just in the sense that he's doing bad things at a, an economic level, he's doing very bad things. It, it, it's alluded to that he's thrown a couple of children off of a bridge, which I think actually happened with True Chapo. story. This is an yeah. actual, this is based on real events, this isn't you having a flight of fancy. How do you as an author write about such evil people without turning them into cartoons? Well, that's the issue. You know, you don't want to write silhouettes, you know, flat figures on your own moral field of white, because that is a cartoon. And I feel I have to do better than that. I feel I owe the reader a much better effort than that. 
So um, uh, 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 someone once described me as a method writer, you know, in that I, I write in the third person, but, but it's the third person subjective if you want to get technical about it. So I'll, I'll start off writing a third person account in the objective and then sneak into the character's thoughts and literally the point of view. Uh, when you do that, you have to, to suspend your sense of evil and good. Uh, I've sat across, because I was a private investigator for years before I, I made it as a writer, I've sat across the table from murderers, child molesters, you name it, uh, looked them in the eye and asked them questions, and I've done that in the research on these books as well. I've never had a single person identify him or herself as evil. They always have a rationalization. They always have a justification. They always have a point of view. We might not like it. We might find it repulsive uh, and upsetting, and it is. But they always have that point of view. Then it's my job as a novelist to, as accurately as I can, write that point of view. Um, for instance, there's a, a hitman in the book that starts out as a 12-year-old hitman. I'm not making this stuff up. And when I heard these stories, I thought there were one of these kids. There's at least a dozen. Well, you, you wonder, that's got to be a monster, right? And I follow him until he's 19 years old and does increasingly horrible things. But what I realized when I got deeper into the research, Andrew, is that, that this kid had been traumatized at age 10 thrown into a reformatory with everything you can imagine that goes with that. And everything that happens to him, and therefore everything that he does, further traumatizes him to the point when you meet him as a 16-year-old, he's psychotic. So then I'm writing through the point of view of a psychotic who definitely observes what he's doing and knows what he's doing, but has such an emotional separation from it that he doesn't realize its consequences. He's just seeing it the way you'd see sort of jagged bits of glass on a broken bottle on the street. So you had to, I had to keep shifting my point of view and my awareness as these characters went on throughout years of this book because their point of view changes. I don't know if that answered the question no, that, you that asked was, me. that was great. That was uh, exactly what I wanted to know. Uh, I, I do want to backtrack to, to you being a private investigator, uh, and, and I, as I was researching you uh, b before this interview, um, you have a very varied background. Uh, you, yeah. you, you I, I think, went to the University of Nebraska, where you, did. you studied African, stu African history. African history, which um, made me a hardcore unemployable. Right. <laughs> and and, and well, well done, Nebraska, and having an African studies department. I wouldn't have anticipated that, but that's great. Right. Uh, and you, you worked as a, a private investigator in, in Times Square, before Times Square, like back when it was the stabbing district, if you, if you need to go get stabbed, you go to Times Square. And you, and you were doing I it. I got stabbed in Times Square. Did you? And you were doing this before, like, I, I would just look at Twitter or something and, and try and, like, you know, go through, go, through, go through someone's search history. You were actually investigating. How, how did that affect your writing uh, coming from so many different backgrounds? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, yeah, I was in Times Square before Mickey Mouse was there. And, um, and it was, you'd walk in the alleys, yeah? And it was like walking on the beach, except instead of stepping on seashells, you were stepping on crack vials. And there was one particular lunatic who would love to drop cinder blocks off the roofs of these buildings. So when we had, we had to go into an alley, you know, which you didn't want to do, uh, you'd, you'd walk and you'd squeeze yourself very tightly against the wall because the trajectory of the cinder block, you know, would then have to arc and come past you. But, you know, there were several nights when I was going through those alleys when you just, you know, when this cinder block would explode, you know, around you. So it was, it was a good deal of fun. And, and you got stabbed? I got stabbed in the butt. <laughs> I've never told this before. Uh, it's embarrassing, but yes, yeah, somebody went to stab me and I managed to sort of deflect it into, you know. And, and so when, when you're writing, uh, when, when you're writing, uh, wounds and all, how, how, how do these, and I think like you've also, you, you, you've done safaris, you've done all these different things, how do these funnel into your writing process? Uh, well, you know, actually it's, it's kind of surprising how they did. Uh, when you're an investigator, uh, as opposed to being stabbed in Times Square, dodging cinder blocks or whatever, uh, a lot of it's paperwork and a lot of it's interviewing witnesses. And 
a lot of researching novels like this is paperwork. You go through thousands of pages of trial transcripts or FBI or CIA papers, uh, and you interview a lot of people. So the end game is different. I'm not trying to elicit a confession, you know, which was my job for a long time. Uh, I'm trying to get information to make a book live. But the techniques are the same, you know? Um, oddly enough, being a safari guide was really useful. A, a great job, by the way. It's a great gig. That sounds more fun than being a private investigator, based oh, on what you've said. By far. I think I'd rather be a safari guide. By far. You know, chasing leopards and elephants around, trying to photograph them, not, not kill them. Uh, and I'm the only person, I, I believe, in the history of my university to have failed photography twice. Uh, I'm a crap photographer, but it was my job to get people in position to take these pictures. Uh, so, uh, but you, you always had to think ahead. You had to, to develop a real eye for detail because details are extremely important. If you're trying to find a leopard, it's a certain kind of tree, a certain branch, certain wind. It's not very interesting, but a lot of detail. And then you're always looking at what's next because if your clients are in the car and they're busy photographing a lion, you kind of don't want to miss the rhino that's coming up on the other side. And you're always going through in your day, because animals are very kind of scheduled by nature. OK, I've gotten them the elephants uh, in about an hour and a half. Those lions that I saw this morning should have moved up in that direction. Do you know what I mean? And so that's a lot like writing a crime novel, because when you're writing one thing, you're, you're also kind of thinking, well, if I do this here, it's going to have to have a consequence there, you know? You, you, you just successfully communicated to me how to write a crime novel, which I don't know how to do, using a metaphor of safari, which I've never done. I'm very impressed. Uh, that, that, that is impressive, to take two things I know nothing about and make them palatable and understandable to me. Well done. I, I have my talents, but they're mine. You know, I, uh, yeah, they're, they're strange, but yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to open up to the audience, I think, because I can Great. see a few people that are itching to ask questions. And I've, I've got more if you guys don't, but, I, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to, uh, to ask Don questions if you have any. Apparently, that's a no. I, have I just bored <laughs> got, you to that we've extent? We've got one up front. Oh, no, one in the back? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, what was it like working with Oliver Stone? Where did that voice come from? Over here. I thought there was someone behind me. Ah, okay, hi, how are you? <laughs> Holy smoke, someone's been hiding behind the stage, and I'm usually pretty aware of who's behind me. Uh, what was now, it yeah. like working with Oliver Stone? Well, it's an interesting experience. Uh, where did the person go? I, uh, I'll just talk to all of you. You know, Oliver's, a, Oliver's an interesting cat. Uh, I, I think Oliver expected someone different from me. You know, I think I wrote a book called Savages, which is about marijuana growers in California, and I think Oliver expected that guy. And I'm not. I'm, I'm perhaps the dullest man in America, actually. I, I won the title in 14, and I have an insurmountable lead this year. Uh, I don't do drugs. I, I don't drink. I drink coffee. And I think Oliver was expecting, like, party guy, you know. Uh, but, but he's an iconic director and a great director. I think he did a good job with the film. He's interesting to take out on location scouts, you know, because I'd, I'd take him out and I'd say, you know, Oliver, you know, because he wanted to see everything. I took him around Laguna where the, the film is set. And he'd say, well, I want to see a, a drug dealer's house. What would that look like? So I took him to a drug dealer's house, you know, and I said, it looks like that. And he says, no, it doesn't. But Oliver, that, that is a drug dealer's house. You know, okay. Where's the money launderer's office? What would that look like? So I take him around to the money launderer's office. You know, and he goes, no, that's not right. But, but Oliver, it is. You know? but, um, but at the end of the day, when he shot the film, he shot these locations, and, and they were dead on. So interesting guy. And, and you, uh, you, you adapted... You have adapted one of your novels to a screenplay. You, you that would, one, you would, yeah. That one. What is that like? Because writing a novel is a long, intense slog, and it, it's you know prob you're probably writing ninety to hundred thousand word novels. These are these are very very big. Whereas a script, you're you're working with such a tiny amount. Is that like amputating limbs, getting that cut down? No, but it's like squeezing them into a box. You know, it's you, you just have to understand that they're different breeds of cat. You know, they they are two completely different media, and they do very different things. And, and I've come to the conclusion that, that a book and a movie can have a separate life. I, I liken them to siblings in a family. Yeah, they're related, they look alike, they come from the same place, but they have different lives, and that's fine. I mean, Oliver put a different ending on the movie than I had in the book. You know, in, in the book, the three guys are dead. Uh, in the movie, it's a little ambivalent, you know? 
or ambiguous rather. So, uh, but but I'm okay with that. Yeah. Do, do we have a question up front? Yeah. Hi, Don. Thanks uh, for coming today. Hi, April. Thanks for being here. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what are you working on next now that Cartel is finished? I think, you know, I'm always working on two books at a time because uh, I just like it that way. You, you know, I like to have more than one horse in the corral. You know, if I get tired of one, I can hop on the other. After writing this book, I think I should write a book about puppies, you know, or something like that, <laughs> that lose a chew toy and go around looking for it and everyone's really nice to them and they find it. Yeah, basically. Uh, but I'm not gifted enough to write children's novels. You know, so I, I'm a crime novelist. Uh, I'll, I'm writing two more crime books right now, but they're not in the field of drug trafficking. It's, it's my fondest hope. You know, uh, I, I don't pray, but if I were to pray, I would pray that there is nothing more for me to write about in this field, that we come to some sort of sanity about our drug laws, that Mexico finds some sort of peace and that that puts me out of this business. That would make me very happy. Yeah, question in the back? Yes, sir. Thanks for coming here. It's Thanks for a, having me. Good experience. Uh, how does one research the life of a uh, hitman from 12 years old to 19 years old? Do you email him? Do you text him? How are you? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, um, I'll give you a very, very vague answer because I, I never discuss sources, and even as a fiction writer, and let me tell you why, because even if I say things that I didn't do, it gives people hints, therefore, on things that I did do. Uh, you, you read about them, you, you communicate with them as best that you can, and you talk to families. But that, that's as much as I can, I can give you on that because I don't want to, to put other people into a difficult situation or myself. Thank you for the question. Don, thank you for protecting my identity there. I really appreciate that. that I, I was worried about that when they brought me on here, but you handled that beautifully. You've, you've done remarkably well for yourself. <laughs> Gavin. I've really cleaned up. Uh, Absolutely. Well, if, if we're waiting for a couple more, I've got one more question. You're with, uh, I, I read in the, in the course, oh, I'm sorry, was there, did I miss one? Oh, no, no, please, this is the Q&A for the audience bit. Please, you, you go ahead. Um, I have a question. I know you've done a lot of research and all of that, but how do you go to making it sort of fiction, but with a lot of facts? Is there a line you have to find to kind of tell your own story without um, becoming just a news book? Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I do probably 14 drafts, somewhere in there, 10 to 14 drafts. And so I would start off very newsy and very historical. I'm a historian by training. And so I, I tend to, to my own fault, lapse into writing history and keeping it too close to the reality. And then an editor points that out to me. Uh, as the drafts go on, I'm much more, I become much more aware of dramatic structure. Uh, and then I, I kind of, some sanity comes over me. Do you know what I mean? When I step back and I look at it and I go, yeah, that's what really happened in that order. But for a novel, it would be better if it happened in this order. Or it might be better if this character rather than that character experiences it. And I'm being redundant here because there were five massacres, for instance, of people in drug treatment centers in Juarez. One would probably do. I don't have to tell all five, you know? Um, and then the other thing is, is just in terms of writing style. You know what I mean? I, I want books to be a, this is very pretentious, but it's the truth. I, I want books to be a physical pleasure to read, a, a, a sensual pleasure to read, yeah? And so then I'm going back very much with the reader in mind. I'll read things out loud to myself. I'll, I'll see if certain events really work better as they really happened, or I might change them a little bit. I love to, to write things initially like write it true north and then kick the compass so it just off to the side a little bit because that's kind of more interesting. Did that answer the question that you asked? Thank you. Uh, so getting, getting to your writing process, I, I, in, in the course of my stalking you basically prior to this, yeah. uh, I, I read that... We were talking about stalkers in the green room. And <laughs> Um, you you uh, you write. I think from five thirty in the morning till ten o'clock in the morning, or every day. This is what I read. Uh, what is it like to wake up 
at five o'clock in the morning? What is... <laughs> Most days, it's great. It, it, it's awful right now because I'm on the road. So if I'm getting up at five, it's to go to an airport, you know, and, you know, go through security and, you know, all that fun stuff. Uh, I love it. Um, look, this is the job I've wanted my whole life, you know, and I feel very, very lucky that I got it. Uh, and, but it's a job and I have to treat it with respect. And, and I know that I have to put in hours so I write from 5.30 to 10, I go out and run or walk four to six miles. I come back and I work again till 5.30. Uh, because it takes for me that much, I call it time on the mat. There's, there's no replacement for it. You, you can either talk about writing or think about writing or you can write. But you can't do those three things at the same time. And I can't just go off to a coffee shop and think about my next novel or, you know, walk through a meadow and, you know, wait for the muse to land on my shoulders and whisper it to me. I've got to be sitting down at a desk and doing it. It's, it's sort of a Nike thing. Just do it. Um, but I, I love that hour of the morning. I, I don't like the sun to find me in bed. You know, we, we live way out in the country most of the year. It's dark. It's cool. It's quiet. And, and I, the best work I do is from, you know, usually 5.30 to 10.30. Well, and you're, uh, uh, by the way, feel free to signal me if you have any questions. I, I am finding myself and you enthralling. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to keep doing this, but I also want to make sure you guys feel like you're, you're open if you want to. Um, you, you've been covering the drug war for a long time. Are you, are you becoming more optimistic about it? Are you becoming more pessimistic about it? Where, where are you and where do you think the country is? Well, I choose to be optimistic about it because the other choice is just too depressing. You know, I can't live with it. I think that there's a, a groundswell of sanity coming. Uh, you know, I wrote this open letter to Congress. I'm so naive. Thinking I'd get some, you know, that's how many members of Congress? 430-something? I thought I'd get one response. Just, just the odds, right? Nothing. Nada, nothing. You know who I hear from? Cops. 50, 60 cops. I've been asked just yesterday, I was in a car going somewhere and, and was phoned by a very high-ranking police officer, city I can't tell you about, asking me to be their consultant. I've heard from DEA agents, and they tell me, privately, we agree. Uh, the United Methodist Church came out three weeks ago asking Congress to end the war on drugs. Uh, President Obama pardoned 46 people and spoke about the insanity of our sentencing. Bill Clinton, I believe, I just saw it quickly on a crawl in the, in the very lovely green room here. The best green room ever, ever. Um, and, uh, and he was saying, man, I got it wrong with these sentencing laws. The man who wrote the mandatory sentencing laws for drugs has now advised the Canadian government, don't do it, it was a tragic mistake. So I'm hoping that, that we come up with, you know, that there is this groundswell. I also think it's a generational thing. You know, so, you know, 10 years ago, if you'd said that, 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 you know, gay marriage would finally, thank you, God, become just marriage, as it always should have been, you know, you would have said, no, that's impossible. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, that something about drug policy happens like that. But... But, you know, looking out at you all, I mean, it's, 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 it's on you. And, uh, and, and I think that's going to happen because I think it's a generational thing. Uh, on the cynical level, I'm just waiting for some people to die, I guess. Well, we all are. And yeah. I think we've got a, we've got a question. We, we, I'll wait for the mic so they can hear you at home. Yeah. Um, did you ever, like, think about, like, wanting to write about, like, the government itself since you, like, had, like, some comments of, like, you wanted to write that letter to the Congress? I ever wondered, like... Do you want to touch that kind of subject? Like, you know, the judicial system, everything about nowadays, you know? Yeah, I think, I think thank you for that question. And a lot of my novels talk about the government. Uh, and that's okay. I haven't read it either. So. Yeah. <laughs> we have it in common. I have not read this book. Um, <laughs> in, in its final form. I shouldn't, this has been recorded, hasn't it? So the, the, the representative from the publisher, I'm just joking around. I, <laughs> I read every word that you sent me on the 16th revision of, and, and all the typos. I just didn't leave coffee cups there to fool you. Um, I, I write a lot about that. 
you know? But again, I'm a novelist and I'm a crime novelist and I'm very proudly within that genre. That, that's what I do. You know, uh, in Europe, they ask you very serious literary questions. And you know, one person one time said, do you think you live in a literary ghetto? You know? And I said, yeah, and I love my neighborhood and I love my, you know, <laughs> love my neighbors. So I, I'm not going to do like sort of blatantly political things. But as I said, you know, every once in a while, one of my characters slips the leash, you know, and starts mouthing off about these things. And, and sometimes that gets through the editor. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not you know, a, a serious policy wonk guy. I, I've sort of become one on this drug issue by default, you know, and because I get so angry about it. And, and then I start going off on these rants. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, not going to. Uh, but, but I do, and, and so I've shot my mouth off, and now I'm out there. Uh, and this cop, in fact, yesterday said, look, are, are you the kind of guy that's just going to shoot your mouth off, or are you going to help us? We're asking you to come to our city and sit down with us. And I said, damn straight, I'll come to your city and sit down with you. Well, and, and on that note, uh, on that note, Don Winslow, we've been thrilled to sit down with you. We're, we're glad that you oh, thank did. Thank you. What I, a I think I speak for the audience. Segue. That, that was that was smooth, man. Now I'm in awe of you. You know. Oh, thank you. All thank right. you. Thank you. But thank you so much. Uh, a, a tremendous writer. I enjoy your rants too. Uh, so I encourage you to keep up at both. And thank you so much for your time with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah.